Hey Calvary, my name is Ben Porter. I'm a member at Calvary Baptist Church. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to this online service. If you are new, I want to give you a special welcome. Uh, if you've been away for a few weeks on vacation, like uh, we have, I want to give you a, a, a welcome back as well. Uh, the beauty about uh, having online services is if you miss a service, you can always go back online and watch the previous week. So I encourage you to do that as well if you have time. I know I've enjoyed the Justice series. We're going to continue the Justice series uh, today. Uh, we're going to be looking at Zephaniah. And um, just before we get into our service, let's just join our hearts together in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you, Lord, that you are good. You are with us. Thank you, Lord, for the beautiful weather you've given us this week. Thank you, Lord, um, for time together with family. Father, uh, we just ask, God, that, Lord, as we look into Zephaniah, Lord, that you would speak to our minds and hearts, Lord, as uh, we're worshiping in, in homes separated from each other. God, I pray, Lord, that, uh, Lord, that you would hear our voices, Lord, and that um, you would just meet us where we are this morning. Lord, we love you, we praise you, God, and we give uh, the rest of our service to you now. In Jesus' name. Good morning, church. This morning's call to worship comes from Romans 8, verses 38 and 39. It reads, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And this passage is so powerful because it speaks directly to the heart of the doctrine of assurance. And God is emphasizing that if we truly are followers of Christ, that there is nothing that could ever cause us to be separated. He tells us how great his love is so that we will feel totally totally secure in him. If we believe these overwhelming assurances, we replace fear with a confident and lively hope. A hope that brings with it an unexplainable joy and peace. An un a hope that carries the ability to release us from, from shame and guilt forever. And a hope that approaches death and judgment without fear. And it is only in the gospel of Jesus that we can find this pure, undistorted assurance of our salvation. Praise be to God for his love for us and for his security. So as we enter into a time of worship, um, let's remember his goodness to us through the truths of his word. Let's pray. Father God, we bow before you entering your throne of grace this morning confident that what Jesus accomplished on the cross is sufficient Lord we give you thanks that you are mighty to save and that your hand plucked us out of the pits of despair secure in your arms only because of what you accomplished on that cross, not because of anything that we have done. And so, Father, we give you praise, we give you honor this morning, and we thank you that for those that are in Christ Jesus, there's absolutely nothing that can separate us from his love. So would you take our worship now, may it be pleasing to your ear, we give you all these things in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. The grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea and I am safe on the soul my salvation I will not fear when darkness falls strength will help me scale these walls I'll see the dawn 
the rising sun. The Lord is my salvation. watching uh, our online service that uh, would maybe not call themselves a part of uh, our church family. I just want to welcome you uh, once again uh, as part of our online service. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Aaron. I'm the pastor of student and worship ministries here at Calvary and, uh, and I just have the privilege and I'm really excited uh, to just be actually finishing off 
our series, Act, Love, Walk. We've been in this series uh, for the month of August, just looking at some of the minor prophets and pulling out themes of justice within the minor prophets. So we're going to be finishing that off today. But before we do, uh, growing up, uh, I was not the easiest child, I am sure, to raise. Uh, I was a, not a very nice toddler, uh, and that rebellious disobedience streak <laughs> Uh, ended up following me, if you will, uh, through my elementary years. And uh, I just wasn't a very, probably the easiest kid to raise. I remember, uh, specifically with me and my mom, we would would not, uh, I'm sure I was a very challenging boy for my mother to to, uh, raise. I remember if my mom said the sky was blue, I'd be like, no, it's gray. I was just that kid uh, with, with my with my mom specifically. Uh, and one of the challenges was I didn't necessarily respect the authority figure of my mother. Uh, my mom, I think, had a bit of a challenge disciplining me. I wasn't really scared of her. Uh, and maybe I didn't really have a healthy fear or respect her authority. And I, I wasn't really afraid uh, if my mom was going to punish me. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, again, I can imagine it be quite challenging. But... There were a few words that my mother could say that would cause me fear. And those words were, wait until your father comes home. I'm sure uh, those words have been said in in many homes, uh, but in my home, I knew in that moment that I was in trouble. That when my dad would got home from work, justice would be administered. I would pay, if you will, for what I had done throughout the day. Uh, It was a tactic I'm sure my mom used, uh, hopefully in love, I would think so. I love my mom. And uh, again, as a dad now, I understand it can be challenging. Uh, You want your child's behavior to change. And so you use whatever tactics you can. And, And again, I knew that when my mom said, wait till your father gets home, judgment was going to be administered. There's a moment in time in the future when justice would be done. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Again, we've been in this series, Act, Love, Walk, based on Micah 6, 8, that that God is a God of justice. He is a just God, and he calls us as his people to live justly in the world. And we're going to be looking at the specific aspect of justice today of God being a God who is just, the aspect of evil being punished or wrongs being righted or the consequences being administered or evil getting what it it deserves. This is who God is. God is a God of justice. He is a just God and he cannot allow evil to go unpunished. It's actually uh, part of who he is. We've been created in his image. And so we love justice. And an example of this is movies. Right where justice is done to the people in the movie who we believe deserve justice. We like that. We like when the bad guy gets what's coming to him. Because part of who we are, uh, created in God's image, is our people of justice. And we like justice when it's administered to people we we think deserve justice. We think of people in our world who uh, are unjust, people, abusers. We think of, uh, I don't know, just maybe some criminals, right, that have been uh, put in prison. We're like, yeah, they deserve to be in prison for whatever it is. Maybe, uh, again, it's murder. Maybe it's, uh, I don't know, you name it. We can think, we can all think of people who are like, yeah, they deserve justice or they deserve to be, uh, to have justice administered to them. But what happens when God's justice is poured out or is administered to people who we don't think deserve his justice? See, the thing about justice and and specifically the, the message of judgment is not one that we do well with in our culture. It doesn't sit well with us. We like to think uh, that for the most part, we as human beings are good. Yes, there are people in our society that we would deem as uh, deserving justice, deserving a punishment, but if we all look at ourselves, none of us think that we deserve punishment. We like to think that we are good people. 
And so we see God, uh, specifically sometimes in the prophets or in other parts of scripture, and where he is uh, calling for justice, he says, I will administer justice. And we think, how could God be loving and yet do that? And I think we do this because we set, uh, we try and set up our own moral standards. We try and determine what is right and wrong for ourselves. This is what we've been doing since the beginning of time. Uh, that's really what Adam and Eve were doing when they disobeyed God. The, the, the devil uh, tempted them by saying, you can decide for yourselves or you can be like God in knowing good and evil. And from then on, we as human beings have tried to figure out what we believe is good and evil. And we all like to think that we are good. And so uh, when we see or when we hear of God saying there will be justice for this person or judgment is coming, we try and justify it and say, well, how could God be loving and yet? But I believe it's because we come up with our own standard of right and wrong. We, we minimize, we say, oh, it's not that bad, or, or uh, I'm not a bad person, or we, we say, well, at least I haven't done that. Uh, or this is just who I am. How could God judge me for, for, for uh, who I think I am? And again, this is the culture that we're swimming in. Uh, what's right for one person is not necessarily right for the other. And, and actually to say that there's objective truth or a standard uh, by which every person should live by is seen as, as bigoted, actually. And so we actually wrestle with this idea of believing is God really just. But the message that we're going to be looking at today from Zephaniah is this message of actual judgment upon a people who didn't believe that they should deserve God's judgment. So we're going to be looking at the book of Zephaniah. It's interesting, actually, that the book of Zephaniah is quite similar to the book of Amos. Pastor Josh preached from the book of Amos. And so Amos was prophesying to the people of Israel, but Zephaniah is prophesying to the people of Judah. And what we're going to find is that similar to the people of Israel, the people of Judah did not believe that they deserved punishment because they were God's chosen people. But yet, they dis because they were disobeying God, God was going to judge them and pour out his justice on them. But before we get into the text, I do want to pray because, again, this message does not always sit well uh, with us, and we need uh, Jesus to uh, and the Holy Spirit's help to help us submit to Scripture. So let me pray. Father God, we thank you so much for who, we, for who you are. We thank you that you are a God of justice, that you uh, do not allow evil to go unpunished. But Jesus, I pray that you would help us have the same standards by which you set. I pray that you would give us uh, an understanding of your holiness. Jesus, we need you to work in our hearts because left to our own demise, we are helpless. So we come to you as we look at scripture, asking you to speak to us, asking your Holy Spirit to help shape and mold and convict and encourage uh, to do what you do as we study scripture. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. May these not be my words, but they would be yours. That you would give me clarity that, that uh, what you want to say this morning to myself and to those who might be watching, uh, again, would be of you and not of me. Have your way in our hearts and our lives, Jesus. We love you. We thank you. All for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. But we're going to be looking at the book of Zephaniah. Uh, and before we jump into what I want to talk about, we need to understand some context for Zephaniah. And where we find that context oftentimes is in chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, The word of Yahweh, or the word of the Lord, that came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. So here we find out the context. So Zephaniah received a word from the Lord. Uh, it gives a little bit of Joseph, or Zephaniah's uh, family lineage. And we do notice that one of the people in his lineage is Hezekiah. And so it's believed, uh, although we can't know for 100% sure, but it's believed that Zephaniah was from royal lineage. That King Hezekiah, who was a king of Judah, uh, Zephaniah comes from his lineage. Uh, again, it's not 100%, but, but we can kind of see that uh, he could be. 
But what the other, the next part is, is in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon. What we see is that uh, Jos- Zephaniah prophesied during Josiah. Now, if you remember two weeks ago, Peter uh, preached a message out of Habakkuk. uh, And he talked a lot about Josiah because, again, his his context is important. Uh, But Josiah was the last good king of Judah. Josiah was a king of Judah, uh, and he sought the Lord. Uh, His grandfather grandfather Manasseh was one of the worst kings of Judah and led the people in rebellion against God for so long. Uh, But yet Josiah... Uh, as his grandson, when he became king at eight years old, was a good king, and he sought the Lord. And it, was, uh, it wasn't that at eight years old, the whole country of Judah, uh, the nation of Judah, completely turned around. There were different points within Josiah's reign that he led the people in reform. Uh, Second Chronicles and Second Kings talks and tells us that uh, in the eighth year of his reign, so when Josiah was 16 years old, he began to seek the Lord. Uh, It was in his 12th year, when he was 20, that he began to rid Judah of its idols. Uh, He went through the nation of Judah and and got rid of the Baals, uh, the altars to Baal, the Asherah poles. He he cleansed Judah of its idolatry. And then it was when he was 26, or in his 18th year of reigning over Judah, that he found the book of the law, uh, and he started to rebuild the temple and and cleanse the temple. And they found the book of the law of Deuteronomy and they read it. And and again, so he led over his lifetime, there was a process of transformation within the people of Judah. The thing is though, is that because, uh, and and Peter said this, the the nation of Judah was so evil that they didn't even know about the book of the Lord. They didn't even know what was in it. Um, And that's why it was so uh, awesome that Josiah found the book of the law. Deuteronomy. But the, uh, and Peter mentioned this as well, the challenge was that when Josiah died, the people continued in their rebellion. They actually rebelled, and, and within a number of years, God brought the Babylonians to bring upon judgment. The reality was is that not everybody in Judah would have had real life transformation and sought the Lord. And so Judah, Josiah, as their king, uh, led them, but some of it would have been behavior modification. And so that's why we see that not everybody, or then after Josiah's reign, uh, there were people who, who rebelled in the nation of Judah, continued in the rebellion. Uh, but I say that uh, because Zeph- Zephaniah would have helped Josiah in his, re- in his uh, reform of Judah. Zephaniah's prophesying uh, probably before uh, the temple is, is rebuilt and the law is found. And so, so God's using Zephaniah to help Josiah uh, reform the people of Judah into some resemblance of repentance. And again, what we see in Zephaniah is a message of judgment because the people of Judah had been uh, living evil life. Manasseh, the king, to uh, Josiah's grandfather, led them in rebellion against God and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so we begin Zephaniah with two like pretty stark verses. And again, Josh said this out of his book, the book of Amos. Like sometimes we read uh, the verses and we're like, wow, that is shocking. And so we read that in verse two, it says, I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares Yahweh. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares Yahweh. It's like God is saying, I am going to judge the world. He doesn't specifically mention Judah though. He starts off by saying, I am going to bring judgment upon the evil of the world. This would have been a message that that, uh, the people of Judah would have just, that would have been normal for them. Uh, Back in, uh, if you go all the way back to Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 12, where God uh, promises Abraham to be the father of a nation. Uh, And he says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And so the Israelite understanding of uh, God's justice was that if there were nations that cursed Judah and Israel, uh, God would exact justice upon them in return. If they cursed Judah or they cursed Israel, God would curse them. And so a message that God was going to wipe the world clean, I guess, uh, was not unheard of. But then we have this hinging point in verse four. Because Joseph and I says, I will stretch out my hand against Judah 
and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. This is where things would have gotten serious for Judah, where they've been like, wait, what? What God does is he warns through Zephaniah of the coming judgment, but on Judah. Again, they wouldn't have thought that God would have judgment upon them because they were God's chosen people. And yet God says, no, actually, I am going to bring upon justice. And here's why. He goes later on into verse 1, or as we continue in chapter 1, past verse 4, we see things of idolatry. Right? I will cut off this place, the remnant of Baal, in the name of the idolatrous priests. Uh, he talks about the worship of other gods, these people who bow down on the roofs, and they, they bow down to the host of heavens. They're, they're worshiping the, the heavens, uh, the stars, the moon. Uh, we see a mixing of religions. We see those who bow down and swear to Yahweh, but also swear by Milcom. Milcom was a, uh, a pagan god. And so they're mixing religions. Uh, it says those who have turned back from following Yahweh, or they've literally just rejected the Lord. They've rejected Yahweh. And interestingly enough, complacent, those who were complacent as well. It says who do not seek Yahweh or inquire of him. This is what the nation of Judah had become under Manasseh. And again, God is using Zephaniah to warn the people of Judah that judgment is coming, and this is why. Because you have done all of these things, because you worship idols, because you worship other gods, because you're mixing religion, because you've rejected me, because you're just complacent and not actually seeking me, it requires judgment. And then Zephaniah, uh, we're going to continue in verse 7. It says, Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of Yahweh is near. Yahweh has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. The big theme in the book of Zephaniah is the day of the Lord is coming. Similar to the fact that my mom would say, wait until your father comes home. This is essentially the message that Zephaniah is saying. Wait for the day when justice will be administered. The day of the Lord is coming. Now the day of the Lord is a theme throughout uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament actually. And up until this point, the day of the Lord was seen as a day where justice was administered, but yet those who humbled themselves before God would be restored. And the greatest example that people would think of is the Exodus, where God brought his people out of Egypt and he uh, administered justice against Egypt. We think of, uh, again, God made a way for the people of Israel to go through the Red Sea. And while they were doing that, uh, the Egyptians were enclosed by the water and they drowned and God administered justice upon Pharaoh and his army. But yet God's people were saved and that is what they would, so they would often think that the day of the Lord is a good thing, that it's a day to remember that God judged his, Israel's enemies and he brought uh, his people and saved them. But yet Zephaniah here is prophesying another day of the Lord where again, God will bring judgment upon evil. And he's saying he's going to bring judgment upon Judah for their evil. He says, for Yahweh has prepared a sacrifice in verse 7. Judah and Jerusalem are going to be the sacrifice because they've rebelled against God. We find out as we continue who is going to be punished. Find the leaders. Uh, it says, on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's son. Uh, he talks about this idea of uh, uh, and all who array themselves in foreign attire. This was the idea that uh, people in Judah would look at the other nations and want to dress like them. And so they compromised themselves to become like the other nations around them. And that was against God's desire for them. That's what against God's law. Uh, we see that there are those who are religious and not in the good sense. Uh, he says, on that day, I'll punish everyone who leaps over the threshold. That was a pagan uh, ritual or a rite that they would do. They would jump over the threshold of the house. Um, and so there's people doing religious activity and they're religious, but not religious uh, in a sense of following Yahweh. It says, those who are violent and uh, bring violence and fraud into their master's house. He goes into verse 10 and 11 to talk about economic, economic injustice. Those merchants who were uh, gaining wealth at the expense of other people. Uh, and then lastly, again, we see uh, a complacency. Those, uh, it says at the end of verse 12, uh, it says, who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, Yahweh will, do, will not do good, nor will he do ill. They've just kind of like been complacent and said, well, whatever. 
And again, this is what Judah had become. This is what they had fallen prey to. And God is calling them and warning them and saying, this is who you've become. And because of that, there is punishment. The day of the Lord is coming. And what we see uh, in verse 14 to 18 is that the day of the Lord is coming, it is imminent, it is close, and it is going to be terrible. This is a day of wrath is that day, a day of distress, of anguish, ruin, devastation, darkness, gloom, thick darkness, battle cries. Uh, It just does not, it's not going to be good. And Zephaniah is illustrating that and what it's going to be like. It is coming. And it's interesting that he says, neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of Yahweh. See, people have become uh, hoping that their wealth would save them, but Zephaniah's like, not even your wealth is gonna be able to save you. Judgment is coming because you have disobeyed God. He goes on in chapter two uh, to talk about uh, judgment against Judah's enemies as well. We see that from time to time in the prophets, that that God would use the prophets to pronounce judgment upon other nations. It's not uh, normal, or it's not a big message within the minor prophets, but it does happen, and we see that here, that God is saying, when the day of the Lord comes, it's coming against Judah, but yes, those surrounding Judah will come. He talks about Assyria specifically, uh, and talks about the fall of Nineveh, and we see that. Uh, Again, he continues on, and then even into chapter three, he continues on uh, and switches back to Judah and Jerusalem. And we're left feeling with the question, is there any hope? The message of judgment is a tough one because it seems dark and gloomy. And it's like, is there any hope? Again, God seems like this wrathful God that he's just coming to exact his justice and it's going to be terrible. Is there any hope? Is there any escape? But the beautiful thing about the Lord is there is. I've come to understand that God is, yes, a God of justice, but when he administers his justice, he does not want us as human beings to experience his justice. And so he provides a way out. And we see that in verse, uh, or in chapter three. In chapter three, we get this uh, in verse 12. It says, but I will leave in your midst the people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of Yahweh. What Zephaniah is saying is that those who humble themselves before the Lord will be saved. Up until this point, uh, much of Judah's sin has been their pride. They've said, I can come up with good and evil on my own and I will decide for myself what is good and evil, and reject the law of the Lord. And and that's what led them to do all the things that they did. They did not submit themselves to God's law. And God says, I'm a just God. Justice has to be administered. Evil has to be punished. But God provided a way out. Actually, it's interesting that the prophets were actually a message of grace or a way of mercy from God. God was saying, guys, I have to punish evil and I don't want you to, I don't want to. And so we sent the prophets to warn them and this is what it is. This is a warning. Zephaniah saying, the day of the Lord is coming. Judgment will be administered. But yet, and here's where the hope is, if you humble yourself before the Lord, he will be saved. We get a glimpse of that uh, in in chapter two, actually. Uh, Two verses three, again, this is, uh, God speaking against Israel's enemies, but it says, or Judah's enemies, it says, seek Yahweh, all you humble of the land who do his just commands, seek righteousness, seek humility, but it's still it's a little bit gloomy because it says, perhaps you may be hidden on the day of anger from the Lord. So there's a bit of hope there, but again, it's like maybe you'll be saved. But in, in chapter three, we find that those who have, those who submit themselves, who are humble, who come before the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me for what I've done. They turn from their ways, not just in behavior modification, not just in their outward actions, but fully inquire of the Lord, seek the Lord, fully will be saved. And this is the hope for the people of Judah in verse 14. It says, sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Yahweh has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, Yahweh, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. Yahweh, your God, is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. 
He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. That's the reality for those people in Judah who would repent, who would turn from their ways, and and God would be their God again. God would be in their midst. And he would save his people. And again, the book of Zephaniah is all about a warning that God's judgment is coming. Repent, but it's also a promise of restoration and assurance that for those who humble themselves before the Lord, they will be saved. Because the day of the Lord is a day of judgment for the proud, but a day of joy for the humble. And again, he talks about a remnant being left in Judah. And we know that that happened. Uh, We know uh, through history that, that God left a uh, remnant of people in Ju- Jerusalem and in Judah. Uh, we also find uh, the interesting thing about the day of the Lord here is, is there's different points uh, that the day of the Lord happens for the people of Judah. Uh, the, the moment of judgment is Babylon does come in and destroy uh, Judah and Jerusalem. They're taken off into exile. But part of Zephaniah's uh, prophecy is that God would bring them back. And in fact, that does happen 70 years later after the people are in exile in Babylon. They do come back and God does restore their fortunes. But the thing is as well is that uh, there's Zephaniah is prophesying about a future day of the Lord. Zephaniah is actually, part of Zephaniah's prophesy, prophecy about the day of the Lord is about Jesus. Again, in verse 15 of chapter three, it says, the king of Israel, Yahweh, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. Zephaniah is prophesying about the coming of Jesus, where Jesus uh, would save people from their sins. And so what does this mean for us? Well, number one, for us, it's a warning as well. Uh, As I was preparing this message, uh, initially, I was just going to list all the things that Judah was charged with and, and It seems like sometimes within the church today, though those same sins we commit. But the biggest thing I want to warn us against is pride. That's the heart of what Judah was struggling with. This idea of coming up for themselves, what is right or wrong. And we need to be careful of that because our pride can lead us to not having a proper perspective of who God is of God's character of justice. We come up for ourselves what is good and what is evil. And it can lead to spiritual blindness for us to say, you know what? This It's okay for me to do that because, I mean, justify it, because we come up with our own good and evil. And my, my prayer is that this would be a warning for us to humble ourselves before the Lord, to recognize that pride Uh, God says, even in the New Testament, that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. God is in opposition of those who would say, uh, not your will, Father, but mine be done. Where we put ourselves in the place of God and we come up with our own definition of good or evil. That's why we have such a problem, which is such an issue with with, with God being a God of justice. We we see him in the the Old Testament and are like, how could God be like that? But it's because we've come up with good and evil for ourselves. We've defined that. Whereas God is warning the people of Judah and Zephaniah, and I believe we need to take heed of that warning. That we need to humble ourselves. It's a warning against pride. And we need to repent. We are called to repent. Again, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. When we humbly come before the Lord and say, uh, God, you are a holy God, and and, uh, I recognize that I need you. I need you. Not my will, but yours be done. And when we ask God to forgive us of our sins, to uh, cleanse us, uh, when we recognize that we stand before God evil, that our sin separates us from him, and when we turn and repent and say, not my will, but yours be done, God forgives us every single time. Every single time. God does that. But then thirdly, it's a message of assurance. That for those who have humbled themselves before the Lord, you can, sh- you can be sure that the day of the Lord is going to be a wonderful day where we experience the goodness of God. See, the reality is, is that there is another day of the Lord coming. The New Testament talks about this. 
that there's another day. Uh, Matthew 24, Jesus talks about it. Luke 12, Jesus talks about it. Peter talks about it. Or no, Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 2 Thessalonians 1. And then Peter talks about it in 2 Peter 3. That another day of the Lord is coming. See, as I said, Zephaniah is prophesying yes to the people of Judah, but there are hints of another day of the Lord. Uh, Jesus, the first time, but even Jesus coming back the second time where Jesus is going to come back and he is going to judge the world for his evil. There is another day of the Lord where, where God will bring judgment upon the evil in the world. But yet if on that day, it will also mean that those who've humbled themselves, it will be a wonderful day because God will get rid of all the evil and we'll get to live with God forever in perfection. Jesus will restore. And so, uh, Again, we need to take this seriously. And, and, and if we move into some practical application, that's the first one. We need to take this seriously. The day of the Lord is coming. Again, we don't hear a lot of messages anymore because it doesn't sit well within our culture. The, the day of the Lord is coming. Jesus is coming back at some point. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour. But Jesus will come back and he will rid the world of evil. And we think to ourselves, that's great because there's a lot of evil in the world. But when we think of uh, our own selves, do we think that we are evil? Do we believe that, there, that we have sin in our lives, that we have sin in our hearts that separate us from God and without Jesus, we stand condemned before God, we stand in opposition. And we need to take this seriously. And it needs to lead us to repentance, to come to the place where we recognize that, you know what, I am a sinful person. I have things in my life that are opposing to God. I have placed myself on the throne of the world and said, my will be done, God, not yours. And when we do that in pride, we, we oppose God. And this is what God is warning us. He says, if you do that, judgment is coming. And he's calling us to repent. He's calling us to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Because as uh, I said this when I preached about Jonah, but we see God's justice and God's love perfectly in the cross. Because on the cross, Jesus put, took the consequences of our sins so that God could pour out his mercy upon us. So that we humbly confess before God, that I am a sinner in need of grace, God offers and extends forgiveness because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. And so maybe this morning or today, whenever you're watching this, you're recognizing that, that I've, I have pride in my life. I think I know more than God. And because of that, I stand opposed to God. And one, the day of the Lord is coming when we will have be held accountable for our sin. And, we, and you need, maybe you recognize you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. That God extends grace to you in the person of Jesus Christ. And my prayer was that you would be repentant and say, you know what, God, not my will, but yours be done. That you would turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, I put my faith in you. I trust you to cleanse me from my sin. Uh, I accept your offering of forgiveness and I commit my life to following you to say for the rest of my life, not my will, but yours be done. But I think this is also a warning for those of us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ to recognize the reality of sin in our own lives. That our seeking of the Lord does not happen once and that's it. We don't just pray a prayer and say, Jesus, forgive me for my sin, and then, and then we go on living our own life. We continue to wrestle with sin in our lives. We continue to wrestle with putting ourselves in the place of God. And we need to continue to repent every day to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives to say, Jesus, where am I putting myself on the throne of my life where you should be? And so my call for you and, and, and my encouragement would be to seek the Lord and say, Jesus, where, where do I need to repent? Where in my life am I not living the way you would have me live? And to repent of your sin because sin is serious business. We need Jesus' work in our lives to help us. Thirdly, to walk in confidence. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ and uh, in humility, you're walking with the Lord, be confident that the day of the Lord is gonna be awesome. When, when uh, Paul is writing to the Thessalonians about the day of the Lord, uh, you can sense that the Thessalonians had a fear about the day of the Lord. But Paul is writing to them to assure them, to have confidence that, that uh, when Jesus comes back, if you've humbly confessed your sin and walk with the Lord, it's gonna be a glorious day. Where Jesus will get rid of evil, he will judge evil. And for those who put their faith in Jesus Christ, it's going to be a wonderful, glorious day. So walk in confidence, but fourthly, pray. 
Uh, 2 Peter 3 talks about the day of the Lord. And uh, again, you can sense that the people that Peter is writing to uh, are getting impatient that, that Jesus is not coming back. And Peter says in 2 Peter 3 that it's not slowness, as we would count slowness, but that actually God is being patient because his desire is that all human beings come to repentance, come to faith in him. And so the reason why God has not exacted justice on the world yet, why he has not come back, is because God is still hoping and praying and working in this world for people to come to him. And we need to pray for that. We need to pray that God would continue to work, that God would give us opportunities to share his message of hope with people so that, uh, because once, the, once Jesus comes back, that's it. There is no second chance. Once Jesus comes and that we, we experience the day of the Lord, evil will be dealt with forever. And that means people, lost people, those who have not come to faith in Jesus Christ will, be, will experience God's judgment. And so we need to pray that, that God will continue to bring people to himself. We need to pray for opportunities to share the love of Jesus. And so take this seriously, repent, walk in confidence, and pray. And, they, and, and would we look at God's just character? And as we look at God's just character, would we see Jesus as our Savior? We need Jesus so bad. And again, I know this is a tough message to hear, that God is a God of judgment, that evil will have its day, but he always provides a way out, and that way out is Jesus. And so when we look to Jesus, let me pray. Jesus, I thank you uh, for who you are. I thank you, uh, God, that you have provided a way out so that we would not uh, have to experience your judgment. I pray, Jesus, that you would uh, cause people to, uh, in humility, come to you and confess their sins and repent and turn from saying, my will be done to your will be done. Jesus, would you work in all of our hearts? Would you uh, show us areas where we need to repent? Jesus, we need you. Would you continue to transform? Not uh, We don't want a behavior modification, Jesus. We want life transformation. And so would you change from the inside out? Jesus, would you uh, reveal your love to us today? That we would recognize the good news that without you, we would stand condemned before God. But because of what you've done, we can stand before God in perfection. Because of what you have done. Jesus, would you continue to work in our hearts? We love you so much. And in your name we pray, amen. I'm just gonna sing one last song as we close our service. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see His wounds, His hands, His feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. Then Son of heaven rose again. Oh, tranquil death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Don't
fields of white The blazing sun Shall pierce the night And I will rise Among the saints My gaze transfixed On Jesus' face Just want to let you know a couple of opportunities that we have for you as we are wrapping up today and as we're heading into this week. Of course, if you'd like to be a part of what we're doing here financially, you can give. You can go to our website. You can click on the Give Now button and follow the links, and that'll help you to give securely as we continue to give to build a kingdom here in Guelph and around the world. Also want to invite you, if you've got children or grandchildren, or you want to see what goes on with our kids' ministry, Christine and her team have come up with a fantastic video uh, for your kids to watch, for your grandkids, for you to watch, and to, to grow a little bit in your faith. And finally, we're excited to welcome you back to the building next week. Uh, we've been talking about uh, people looking for people who will serve. If you want to email me, uh, we can line you up to help serve as we get back into the building because there's some different requirements that we have. And last week, Shannon did an incredible video showing you what to expect as you come to church. Uh, on our first Sunday back on Labor Day weekend. So we're excited to, to welcome you back into the building. You will have to register. There's about 100 spots. Registration is limited. So you'll get a link in an email this week, and you can click on that. And if you don't get that email, you'll be able to register, of course, by going on our website and finding a register button. You can click that, and then you can be part of our service coming up this Sunday as we head back to the building for a Sunday worship service together. We'll be celebrating communion. We'll be doing that without actually taking the, uh, the emblems for the first month. Uh, this week, we'll be looking at communion. We'll be taking and celebrating it, but we won't be taking the bread and the cup. But we will be celebrating, and if you're celebrating at home, of course, you can continue to celebrate communion with us. Join me now as we do our sending scripture. It comes from Micah chapter 6, verse 8, and it says this. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Blessings on you, Calvary. We'll see you next week, whether you join us live in person or join us online. We look forward to worshiping with you then.